welcome to week two. Uh, by now you should be finished or nearly finished with your first uh, formal assignment. You should know at least a little bit the members of your group and have a much better understanding of the parts of speech that we were looking at, um, subjects, verbs and clauses. This week we're going beyond the clause. We're looking at sentences as a whole and what we're using to do this, we're moving on from songs when we're going to newspaper articles. So my job in the next three lectures is to explain what the parts of the sentence are that we're looking at, how we identify them, and uh, that's probably about all actually. Oh, and, and, and also about how we add information to nouns as well. Okay, so let's go. So within a sentence, there are clauses. We know that. We've seen a lot of clausy sentences, dependent and independent clauses. There are also other things. So let's take a look at this example below. Even as the American economy shows tentative signs of a rebound, the human toll of the recession continues to mount with millions of Americans remaining out of work, out of savings, and nearing the end of their employment benefits. This is a pretty typical sentence from the New York Times. We see it's quite complex. It's got lots of different parts. We note, and we'll spend more time examining this in detail later, that all the different parts are separated with commas. Commas are going to be very important in the work that we're doing in this next unit because they show us the different parts of the sentence that we care about. So the underlined portion of this big sentence is the independent clause. There is only one independent clause, um, and we'll see why in a minute. But as we see, we have a verb continues, we have a subject, the human toll of the recession, we have a head noun, toll, um, and that's about all we care about, right? So let's go on and see what other elements we can look at. Oh, I did that already. So just take another look at it. If it doesn't make sense, pause the lecture, Look at your textbook, see what you think. Here's another familiar creature, something we've seen before, the dependent clause. There we see that at the beginning, even as is a subordinating conjunction. So immediately we're thinking, okay, I think I know what this is. There was one um, uh, question in quiz three which threw a lot of people for a loop. It started with as, I can't remember the rest of it, but it looked like the beginning of a dependent clause, but actually was a modifier on a noun. So we, didn't, we can't always just look for a subordinating conjunction. We have to check that it's a clause by finding a subject and a verb. So we have a subject, the American economy. We have the verb, shows. So here we know that this is a clause. The uh, subordinated conjunction tells us um, that it's a dependent clause, and that's the only thing that makes it different from the independent clause that follows it. Um, and we see the boundary because of the comma. So that's why it's important. For dependent clauses, they begin with subordinating conjunctions, they end with commas when they're in the beginning, when they're at the beginning of the clause. Okay, so what's next? Look, I'm so, I'm so keen on commas. This um, just gives you a little bit more information about what they do. Commas separate independent clauses from things that modify them. So what do I mean by modify? For nouns and for clauses, that's what we're going to be looking at in this assignment. Um, the modifiers give more information about the event or state described in the independent clause or more about the thing described in the nouns. We'll get to nouns in lecture three, but I want to anticipate it a little bit, saying the things that we talk about here are going to be relevant for nouns too. So we think about a dependent clause as just one type of modifier. It uh, adds more information about the basic event or state described in the independent clause. Here's another kind of modifier called a prepositional phrase. I hope that you know this word preposition. Um, it's a, uh, a preposition is a word that locates a um, something, whatever, in space and time. So a prepositional phrase is a, a phrase that starts with a preposition. And that's how we're going to name these phrases, by what's, what begins them. Uh, leaving aside the dependent clause, all of the other modifiers that we look at for um, the sentences are going to be named by what begins them, the kind of word. So this, again, is this concept of category. 
it's really important because you've got to figure out the category of this element at the beginning and then you'll be able to figure out the rest. So we know at the beginning we have a dependent clause, we know in the middle we have the independent clause. All that stuff afterwards, we've got to figure out what that is. And so we look after the comma that um, ends the independent clause and we see the word with. So I can look up in a dictionary if I'm not sure what, what with is. And that's something you might have to do. You might be checking these little words, but a dictionary will always tell you, it will write prep or it will write P or something like that. That will tell you what you're looking at. So this with tells us what we're looking at here. And we know it's not a clause because there are no uh, tensed verbs in here. And I'm going to go into a little more detail describing why there might be verby, thing, verby looking things, but they're not a tensed verb, so they can't make this into a clause. Um, the ref there's a reference at the bottom of this page, chapter 1 from 25, page 25 onwards. I've made a huge list of prepositions there, so that should be your first port of call for identifying prepositions. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the prepositional phrase, with millions of Americans remaining out of work, out of savings, and nearing the end of their employment benefits. What is this? This whole thing is a prepositional phrase. Um, but And that's all modifying the independent clause. But things like remaining out of work, out of savings, and nearing the end of their employment benefits, they're all adding more description to the noun Americans. Um, that's our head noun here in this noun phrase. We're going to spend a lot more time with noun phrases in lecture number three. But even if you see a word like remaining and you're thinking, oh, verb, 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 or you see nearing and you're thinking it's a verb, make sure if you're feeling a clause feeling, make sure there's an auxiliary. We saw in the last week's lectures that without um, an auxiliary, a verb ending in ing can't be the main verb of a sentence. Okay? So, see? It's not a tensed verb, and that's the crucial difference, this idea about tense. Um, we remember the, we're refining our definition of a clause. A clause is a unit of meaning built around a tensed verb. More on verbs without tense is on pages 18 to 23 and pages 28 to 30 in your textbook. And this is very important for modifiers, for sentence modifiers. There are three types of tenseless verb, past participles, present participles, and infinitives. And so they can be the main verb in the sentence when they're combined with an auxiliary, but not when they stand alone. So if I say, I am running to the shops, um, that's fine. We would mark that running as a tensed verb. But if I said something like, running to the shops, I tripped over. Tripped is the tensed verb in that sentence. If you want to pause this and write those two sentences down and compare them, that might be useful to do. But in the slides to follow, I have more um, examples. So I'll refer to these as, this class of verbs as either verbs without tense or tenseless verbs. And in your textbook, I believe they're called tenseless verbs. So the first kind we're going to look at are present participles. Then they, they're very simple to identify because they end in ing. So here we have another example. Call them the new poor. That's a command, by the way. See? No subject. Call them the new poor. People long accustomed to the comforts of middle class life are now relying on public assistance for the first time in their lives, potentially for years to come. So we ha see that I've marked it up on the third bullet point. People is a subject, R is a tense auxiliary, now is an adverb, we can ignore that, um, and relying is the main verb. We see that in the th fourth bullet point, there's um, if we leave the R out, that tense auxiliary, this isn't a good sentence, people now relying on blah. So relying is a, pl a present participle, and these examples that we see here show it functioning as a part of a verb phrase in a clause. So it's a part of the, uh, it follows the tensed verb. Here's a different kind of participle, um, and it functions roughly in the same way. It goes with different auxiliaries, um, but it does the same kind of work as a, uh, as a present participle, just locates um, whatever we're talking about in a different point in time. 
So here in Southern California, Jean Eisen has been without work since she lost her job selling beauty salon equipment more than two years ago. In the several months she has endured with neither a paycheck nor an unemployment check, she has relied on local food banks for her groceries. So it's a sad story, right? Um, this is from last year. I think we'll see the same stories this year. Um, so being endured and relied are all past participles. Uh, they locate, um, they locate, uh, they, they go with a verb that locates um, the event or the state in the past. And we see that's true of Jean Eisen has been without work. So, you know, clearly past. Um, oh, that been word, I say been. Americans say been. So if you're confused, that's my pronunciation. So I like the present participles. When past participles act as the main verb in the sentence, um, they have to be accompanied by an auxiliary. And we see the same auxiliary in this passage, has, has, and has. Um, and that gives us the tense. So without that, if you just imagine cutting them out, um, the meaning changes. So uh, past participles like endured look like past tense verbs. But you can't say something like, well, in standard English, um, you can't say Jean Eisen been without work since she lost her job, etc. You can say in the several months she endured with neither a paycheck makes fun. It doesn't really make sense. And you can say relied. So sometimes past participles look like past tense verbs. If you're seeing them and you want to identify them as a, a main verb in a clause, see if they've got an auxiliary. A past participle will always occur with an auxiliary if it, they are the main verb in a sentence. The third kind of uh, tenseless verb that we're going to be paying attention to is an infinitive. And we saw these sort of um, in when we were talking about modal auxiliaries. An infinitive is the two form of a verb. So if I say I want to go to the shops, to go is the infinitive. It doesn't have tense. If you take the two off, it's the unconjugated verb. And so that's what we saw with the uh, with the modal auxiliaries in lecture two, so failing to create jobs in sufficient numbers, etc. That's an infinitive with the two form. The unconjugated verb is uh, economists fear that the nascent recovery nascent means being born. Um, economists fear that the nascent recovery will leave more people behind than in past recessions. So we see will will functions as a um, modal auxiliary, though it tells us about time and space. There's a complicated historical reason for that that I won't tell you. Um, but we see it's um, uh, followed by an unconjugated form of the verb. And you can tell it's unconjugated simply by sticking a to. Do we say to leave? I want to leave. Oh, good. Then we know we have a, um, an unconjugated form of the verb. Okay? Read up about these. This is a lot of information quickly. But I'm just giving you the overview. So why they can't carry clause on their own, that is, they have no tense, they can start phrases that modify independent clauses. And they're used very frequently in journalistic writing, also in academic writing, but we're looking at journalistic writing here. So these phrases that begin with tenseless verbs can either precede or follow the independent clause that they modify. So let's have a look at some examples. In a minute, <laughs> we'll have a look at examples in a minute. So these are what we're going to call them: present participial, pa present participial phrases, past participial phrases, infinitival phrases, and something I haven't mentioned but will be pretty familiar to you: adverbial phrases. So we're going to see examples of all of these in the next lecture. <laughs> Apparently, I don't know what my lectures contain. This is the um, the overview lecture, just introducing you, the terms to you. I think it's time to take a break anyway, but um, we're going to look at these in more detail, how to identify them in the next lecture. And in the lecture after that, we'll look at noun modifiers. So have a read of your textbook, and I encourage you to do the exercises in the textbook. They'll give you practice. If you're not looking, they say, find something in your own writing. I suggest instead you just take a page of a book, take, a, take an article from a magazine and see what you can find. And then do quiz number four. That will ask you to identify independent clauses in sentences that have modifiers attached to them. So we know by now you should be very familiar with how to do an independent clause. So this shouldn't be a hard quiz at all. All right, good luck. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.